Mark 5, verses 1 to 20. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now, a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, And people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there, clothed, and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. Lord, we plead with you that you would refresh our weary souls, restore our joy and confidence in Christ, and repaint again that glorious, powerful picture of Christ, that we may see him as we ought, worship him, as he deserves, and that we should preach him as we ought to do so. And please, would you enable me that I will not stand in the way of you speaking and refreshing your people this evening. And all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Is Jesus powerful? Or as you look around in your own ministry, perhaps in your own country, Is the enemy winning? What is the latest statistic that you've got? How many more ministers are down? Perhaps how many believers have left the church? How many churches have turned away from proclaiming the gospel? And sometimes that can even sound like you're just talking about the whole country. But perhaps as you think about your own ministry, whether you're a gospel worker working among the students, or maybe a pastor in a local church, 
As you look at your own church and your own surrounding, maybe perhaps the shrinking numbers, maybe the, the growing anti-gospel movement, maybe very few encouraging stories, and, and you must be hearing some of us giving testimonies here, and you're almost just thinking, Jesus might have just gone to live in Africa nowadays. There's nothing worth reporting in our social media pages. Is Christ still at work among us? Is he even as powerful as he used to be? In these particular first chapters of the book of Mark, as it were, and as Mark gives us this explanation of the gospel of Christ Jesus, he is painting to us a picture of who Christ is. So that as we see his identity and who he is, we may be encouraged not only to follow him, but I hope for all of us here, gospel workers will be encouraged to keep on knowing that he is still powerful and still at work. But sometimes it's, it's very hard to see that. If you are, and I am speaking to ministers and gospel workers who are on the forefront, on the trenches of it, waking up every day to think about the church, about evangelism, about discipleship, and seeing all the wounds that perhaps are happening. It's, it's sometimes very hard when you are very near it and you are at the right in the bottom of it, sometimes to see anything happening. Yesterday, I came around, you, you would want to know, um, because I didn't want to get lost today uh, for the conference. So I came around looking for this venue yesterday. And as I alighted the bus there and took a bit of a walk along that particular pathway there, I came and passed the entrance without knowing that I had reached the destination here. And the map could tell me that this was the place. But as I looked at all these sort of things that are holding, looks like a construction ongoing, I thought, this can't be the venue of the EMA. But as I decided to cross to the other side of the road, and I looked, and behold, there was that big banner there written, Emmanuel Center. And I said, oh, here I am. And of course, coincidentally, I saw one of the staff members just coming out of the door, and I waved, and I knew that I had gotten into a place. And sometimes when you are very near to the very place you are in, when, when that is where you are spending your time and your days, it is very difficult sometimes to see as if there is anything good that is happening. And so I do want to invite you as we look at Mark chapter 5, even though we are the people on the front line, to almost step back and see in a fresh way a picture of the owner of the church. And do you know who is the owner of the church? Jesus Christ. A picture that tells us his power and his majesty and who he is. And hopefully that will warm our hearts. That even as we go back to the trenches, we will know that we are not alone, but he is at work in us. And we will know that we are not the people at the end of the day who have to make things move. It is the owner of the church, the one who founded the church, the one to whom the church belongs to. The one who says, actually, even, even the gates of hell shall not prevail. And so, come with me in the book of Mark, chapter 5, as we get this painting, this image of Jesus, who is actually the Lord over the demons. But to begin with here, we start by a story that is not very exciting. We see the helplessness of man under the hands of destructive uh, demons. I call them destructive because in a minute we are going to see how they have possessed this man. We are told here at the beginning that he was possessed with unclean uh, spirits. And as a result of that, his, his life, is really messed up. I think that's actually a bit of an understatement. Well, Jesus and his disciples has just, if you just come with me in verse 1 there, they have just docked 
in a Gentile region, a country we are told, the country of Gerasenes. And he steps out to a very different kind of welcome, not the welcome you and I might want to have on a Sunday morning. It is a welcome there, verse 2, from a man, we are told, is coming from the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Later on, we are told, is actually uh, demons. But the story of this man is anything but a miserable. We are told there he was possessed by unclean spirit demons, and it wasn't just one demon. A little on, we learn there, look at verse 9, it's actually an army of demons. It's actually a region, many of them. He is isolated. He is living among the tombs as good as dead. In fact, Luke tells us that he wore no clothes. And look at verse 3b there. Just look at verse 3 there with me. You're told that he lived among the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. This man under the influence of demons was wild and powerful. He was living like a beast. No one, not anymore, nothing could, no one had the strength to be able to subdue him. Not even the shackles of the chains, for we are told there they proved futile. He would break them in part and pieces. And to the community there who are trying to restrain him, he was definitely the scum and the scare of this particular town. And that's not just enough. This was not just a one-day experience for him. For we are told there that this went on day and night. This was a man who knew no luxury of sleep. For day and night, he was up and down running, always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Here is a man broken inside and outside. He is experiencing the chaos within and without. Can you see, brothers and sisters, the strong hand of the demons has removed every sense of humanity stripped of any dignity a man can ever have. And yet as Mark presents to us this image, this wretched image, I think we are meant to be left with no doubt that the enemy has any good intentions for humanity. Just in case we might be guessing, the devil has just a different way of doing things than God. He is actually destructive. Oh, I know in a world today, and I'm no theologian um, of any standard to speak about demons a lot. Where I come from, in Africa, in Kenya particularly, perhaps we have more awareness of the devil and sometimes unhelpful exaggeration. We can get the demons everywhere, including um, in the tea or something like that. But perhaps where you are seated, maybe slightly things are different. But I think this, this quote from C.S. Lewis, I always find it very helpful whenever I'm thinking about demons and the devil. This is what C.S. Lewis says, that there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves, the devil says, C.S. Lewis, are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialistic or a magician with the same delight. Here is the thing. The devil is not a scarecrow or a fictional character. Garasins could have been any place in the whole world, London or Nairobi. The devil is real, brothers and sisters. His work is real and it is destructive. And even to this day, it is still visible wherever we are. And that's the context of our ministry. 
where the devil is actually blinding people not to see the truth of the gospel, advertising himself, not necessarily in sort of putting people who are naked. Sometimes he does that. But actually, there are so many in our cities walking in nice suits, speaking polished languages, but they are walking dead, desperate, and needy. Can I just, a quick one here for all of us who are involved in gospel ministry. I wonder how this truth of the devil at work in the world shapes your ministry. I wonder whether when you're preparing your own sermon, whether does it ever cross your mind that the people who you are going to be speaking to or even meeting at the streets, that beneath their rebellion and brokenness is a strong hand of the devil at work. Does it shape our sermons or our prayers? Or is this one of those truths where it's more like those good old notes and handouts from college that is somewhere kept safe and you might show to your children or other people? Because you see, the enemy is at work. He is destructive. In fact, the end goal of it is not good at all. For when Jesus Christ, and we'll come to that in a minute, when he gives them permission to go out from this particular man, they get into the pigs, and the next destination is actually the pigs are drowning. His destruction eventually will lead to death. And that, friends, is where all of us are coming from. Africa, Nairobi, Lagos, Nigeria, London, Netherlands. The devil is roaming the streets, blinding men and women. But here is a beautiful truth. Perhaps I shouldn't give the devil a lot of air time. Here is the second thing that we see from this particular passage here from verses 6 to 13. Is that Jesus Christ is powerful and merciful. Let me remind you, Jesus Christ who is the head of the church, is powerful and merciful. Jesus Christ, who founded the church, is actually powerful and merciful. Now, Mark had freezed the meeting of Jesus Christ with this man to give us a bit of a clear picture of the tragedy that this man who was possessed by the devil was in. And now he, 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 he brings us back in verse 6. Look at it there. To show us how that meeting with Jesus Christ had a huge impact. This man comes running to Jesus Christ. He falls on his knees on him. And I want you to look something there that's interesting. That when the demons, of course, possessing this man come into contact with Jesus, there is no confrontation at all. It's actually... From there on, all the way from verse 6 all the way to verses 13, it's all about pleadings and beggings. Now, there's no doubt from what we have just looked at in the last couple of verses that the demons are actually powerful. But when they meet Jesus, they are no match to him. And I like this because, again, I come from Africa where Sometimes this idea of kicking out demons and driving them demons can tend to occupy our services a lot and take a lot of time. But, but here, actually, verses 6 to 13 is, is no really occupation of pull and push, but it's actually demons crying out, begging Jesus, pleading with Jesus that he would actually be merciful to them. There's something here for us to check. What may have looked like mission impossible. When Jesus shows up, the fight is over before it can even start. In fact, the truth of the matter is the demons themselves know who Jesus is. Look at verse 7. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Friends, these are the demon speaking, not a bishop. Earlier on, 
when Jesus Christ was traveling to come to this particular legion of the Gentiles. He was with his disciples. And as they, as they, they were traveling, there was great storm and, and they were all frightened and they woke Jesus. And Jesus, you know, stilled the storm and, and they marveled. And as they were marveling, verse 41, they were asking themselves, who then is this man that even the wind and the sea obey him? Guess who gets to answer that question? The demons. Of course, we shouldn't over rely with the testimony of the demons. But I think on this one, they get it right. That Jesus Christ is the son of the most high God. Above all the other gods. And at the end of the passage there, we see it is true that he is the Lord over demons because the man who has been tormented by demons for wrong, at the end of the day, he is restored and the demons are kicked and driven out. Not only that, as the demons are begging Jesus Christ, look at that there, they're begging there saying, verse 12, please, please, Send us to the pigs. Don't, 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 don't kick us away from the country. How powerful is Jesus? Well, it's clear that he is more powerful than the demons. He is Lord over them. As some people have said, he, you know, the demons are like dogs. On a leash. But it's also clear here from the mission of Jesus Christ that the good news is that Jesus Christ has come to, 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 to get people out, to redeem, to rescue people from the captivity of the evil one. He will destroy the destroyer of the humanity. He is a stronger man who binds the strong man. He is a serpent crusher who is literally doing that with ease. And later on, he will, at the cross, triumph over the powers of evil and put them, Paul tells us in Colossians, to open public shame. And at the end of the age, we look forward when he will actually confine the devil to eternal abyss. Here is the one who holds the powers of hell at bay. You see, the devil has always threatened the church for 2,000 years. Actually, I think older than that because he was there at the Garden of Eden deceiving Adam and Eve. But here is the one truth. And Jesus said it to Peter. He has not prevailed against it. And even to this day, as we stand here 2023, Christ is still building his church. And if Christ does not return, even in the next 100 years, and I encourage all the pastors and all the gospel workers today, the church will still be going strong. It's possible to look at our churches and think, oh, everything is going down. Christianity might be extinct in the next couple of years. Well, I tell you what. Buildings might come down. Denominations might come down. But the church of Christ will prevail. For not even the powers of evil will be able to prevail in them. Just a, just a quick one here for, for the minister. Again, I think we are big and, and it's, it's correct to, to preach that Jesus Christ came to rescue us from our sins and I think that's very true. But it's also true that he came to rescue us 
from the powers of the evil one. He came to deliver us from that strong hand of the enemy. He came to deliver men from that evil one who is blinding their eyes so that they cannot be able to see the truth of the gospel. And I know I'm speaking to pastors who are on the trenches of it perhaps for many years. And you can attest, even sometimes having years of walking with somebody trying to point the gospel to them, and they just cannot seem to get it. Or just even seeing people being broken, families being broken. But can I encourage you that the demons will not have the last laugh for Jesus Christ has conquered them on the cross. Well, here is our last and the third point. The two beggings. Sorry, guys, I couldn't get any creative beyond this. But here is a good thing about the word of God. Verses 14 to 20. Now, you would be thinking, if we only ended the sermon just where we have ended it, I think it was good enough, is it? That Jesus Christ has, has conquered the evil one and is true even at the very end of the age. Oh, well, here is an interesting one here. And we get two beggings in a chapter that is full of beggings. This is not the only beggings that we get in this particular chapter because we have already seen the demons begging before that they would be sent to the pigs, the man falling on, the, uh, on the Jesus' knees here. The only person who is actually not begging in these particular 20 verses is Jesus Christ because he is a powerful one. And yet here in the end, we get two beggings. One of them is a surprising begging. Look at verse 14 with me here. It's, it's one, people begging Jesus. After performing this great miracle, they are begging Jesus to leave their town. What a shock and a pity. You see, after this miracle, news spread very fast. And a crowd of people, you know, milled around Jesus. And they looked at the man who they all knew. They looked at Jesus who had performed this miracle. And look at verse 17. If it was my church, I would have asked all of them to read it together. But I will read for you. Verse 17. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. Can you imagine? I would have thought... After doing such a miracle, perhaps people should have run to look for other needed people who needed Jesus to work a miracle on them. Or if they are more generous, perhaps draw a party for Jesus. We have a new sheriff in town who is actually setting people free. No. Thank you, Jesus, for your services today. You are a good egg. But can somebody direct him to the next train station? You might be thinking, no, no, this must be a question of mistakes, is it? Maybe they are not quite sure who has performed the miracle. And they think actually, maybe Jesus is now holding the, the demons with him. Now look at those verses with me. Quickly look at those verses with me. Because Mark points to us clearly. Look at verse 14. The herdsmen went and told them. And they came. Verse 14, they saw for themselves, and they saw Jesus, verse 15, and they saw the demon-possessed man who had the region, sitting there, clothed, now not naked, and in his right mind. If that is not enough, look at verse 16. The eyewitnesses explained to them what exactly happened both to the demon-possessed man and even the pigs which are now dead. And verse 17, please leave. So both the crowd and everybody here, in fact Luke tells us it's a whole city, they say, please leave. I think in a quick way, here is just that glimpse, is it, of, of man's rejection of God. 
Leave us with our own demons. Leave us with our own brokenness. We will choose to stay in oppression or not to. Except, I don't think necessarily they are saying we want to live with demons. I think what is happening here is that they look at the power for Jesus and they are thinking, we don't want to live with a person who is that powerful. You see, such a powerful being, and, and in the book of Mark, we get so many times when Jesus does something and people marvel and are afraid of him. If you meet that, all that presence and glory and power, either that power of Jesus will attract us to him, and we will fall on our knees and seek refuge in him, or we are going to be on our heels. And we will run away from him. And what they are doing here is to say, we don't want anything to be with you. Unfortunately, no one thinks that when they are saying no to Jesus, actually it's saying yes to the devil. They think, obviously, we don't want these powerful guys. I think we will be our very own masters. That's one of the sins and the rebellion of humanity. We think we will be the masters of our own destiny, except there is no sitting on the fence. You are either a slave to Christ who gives you freedom, or you are a slave of the devil who works you like this particular man. And so in saying no to Jesus, they are saying yes to the devil, and actually they are taking pride in, our, in their own brokenness, taking offense in that which makes them whole, and giving time and energy to that breaks them. That's what the world sometimes wants. They want Jesus they can control, not a Jesus they can't control. Of course, the folly of that is that the Jesus you can control is not useful. He cannot even save you from the demons. Just a quick one here, because... Or as pastors there, I wonder how this again informs our work, our ministry, and even our own preparation. How much do we stop in the middle of our preparation and remember that Jesus is much more powerful than the demons I might actually even face outside there? But also how many of us host to think actually that the world outside there is not just saying no because our sermons are not well organized and maybe because we are wearing long trousers or, or short ones. But actually, is that rebellion to the powerful Jesus? They are saying almost no to that kind of a God. But there's a good example here, verse 18. Because as they are pleading for Jesus to leave, here is quite the opposite response from this man. He is actually pleading that he may live together with Christ. Jesus. Look at that. As Jesus is, is departing, he is getting to the boat. The man who had been possessed with demons is begging that he might be with him. He's not always a good behavior to compare pastors with a demon-possessed man. But I think this is something good we can take from here, pastors and, and gospel workers. I think there's something we can learn from this man. His desire, his longing, his attitude is to be with Jesus. Of course, this is a man who was experiencing hell inside and outside. This is a man who had just experienced the powerful hand of the enemy and now is living under the powerful shadow of Jesus. And he says, I want to be with you. Couldn't help but just pray that that will be our posture, friends. When perhaps the, the world around us is all saying, we don't want anything to be with Jesus. Should that be just me and you, or you alone who is remaining in that particular church, I pray that you will still say, I still stick with Jesus Christ. And of course, there is, lastly here, the surprise response of Jesus to the man. As the man is pleading with Jesus, can I actually go with you? Jesus says, no, and yes. 
No, you, 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 you will not go with me. Look at those verses there. Verse 19. He says there, Go. Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. For he has had mercy on you. Go and witness. Here is a man who, had, who was secluded, living in the tombs. And what a wonderful picture here. He is now restored, even to his family. And now Jesus is saying, now go and actually witness to them. Here is a prisoner turned the preacher. He is a man who was rejected. Now he is going to be a man who is in the help committee of this particular community and the family. And of course, the news that Jesus Christ gives him is no less. You might be thinking, surely this is careless of Jesus Christ. No, any training for him, no corn here or anything. In such a toxic community, just to leave somebody there. Or he tells him something. The news he is going to do is go and tell about Jesus and how he has had mercy on you. Of course, these news are, are not less powerful than Jesus himself. It is the news about the Jesus who is powerful and great and of his mercies. Paul says of, of the gospel, is it, that it is the power of God for salvation. It is not less. It is actually the power of God for deliverance of men who are trapped by the evil one. It is what actually fetches men from the kingdom of darkness, of evil, and transfers them into the kingdom of God. Can I encourage us here, whether the people in our countries or in our regions are trapped in modernism or traditionalism, whether they are religious or irreligious, they are in bondage of the evil one. But our hope, our confidence, our weapon is in Jesus and in his saving gospel. And my encouragement to you and I, as you go back to the trenches, as you go back to that particular church that does not belong to you, it belongs to Christ, please go back with that fire that Jesus is powerful even over the demons. And up to the very end of the age, he will continue to save men and to help them. Amen.